very good morning, everyone. I really appreciate your turning up this morning, you know, especially after the conference party last night. I know it's always a, a challenging time to be up uh, the next day so early. Um, so what I'll do today is to talk a bit about um, one of my pet projects, conservation drones, as a case study for how we might um, want to think about, uh, think, think deeper about some of the issues concerned with emerging technologies for conservation before, um, before we jump on the bandwagon and, and, and adopt them. Um, so s most of you must have uh, heard of drones or have even flown one yourself. Uh, this was uh, quite a few years ago, eight years ago, and Serge, Week, and myself um, were one, uh, I guess, were one of the first few people who started using drones um, to, uh, to help with our research in the tropics in, in Southeast Asia. And this was uh, one of the first few uh, drones that we built uh, in Zurich. At that time, I was uh, still uh, at ETH Zurich. Now, nowadays, you can quite easily uh, buy drones off the shelf you know, from really affordable ones you know, for a few thousand dollars to several tens of thousands of dollars. But back then, uh, we had to, uh, to build our own drones uh, from scratch. And this uh, is one of the first few uh, field trips that we took to uh, Sumatra, Indonesia, um, to uh, test fly uh, the drones in one of the uh, forests that um, Serge had been working in for a long time. So soon after uh, those uh, field trips, we started working with partners around the world uh, who were also interested in using this new technology. Um, and we traveled uh, quite uh, widely to, to all over the world, um, working with not just the, 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 you know, the NGOs, but also fellow other conservation scientists like ourselves, and uh, you know, it's just basically exploring different applications of, of this technology. Um, and during those few years, I think we, we all learned a lot about uh, what drones can and cannot do. And over the next few slides, I will just go through some of the uh, most promising use cases and more importantly, highlight some of the, uh, the pitfalls or the challenges that we uh, might want to think about before we uh, start to use this uh, technology. So the most promising use cases can be um, broadly grouped into three main types, you know, uh, what I would call enforcement, uh, and secondly, mapping applications, and thirdly, wildlife surveys. I won't spend too much time on each of those. Uh, I will just quickly give you a few examples, um, and I'm sure you can find out more if you want to. So I'll first talk about enforcement. And what I really mean by enforcement is to use drones as sort of uh, flying binoculars, uh, just um, having the ability to, to look at your surroundings uh, from the air. Um, this, for example, is a uh, picture taken in uh, the Gunung Lusa ecosystem or national park in North Sumatra by one of our partners, uh, the SOCP, Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program. Um, and you know, we went there, we gave some training to the group, and they were able to uh, use the technology and, and fly the drones uh, quite regularly uh, over parts of the national park uh, as a way to, to monitor uh, those areas for illegal logging. And as you can see in this next picture, which was taken a few months uh, later, uh, they were able to detect uh, evidence of illegal logging. And if you look carefully at the, uh, the river boundary or edge, you can see that the loggers left a strip of forest around the river uh, to obscure, basically to hide the crime scene from the river traffic. So in this case, the drones were very useful to, uh, in terms of being able to, to detect this, uh, uh, this instance of illegal logging. 
We've also worked with um, people uh, in the marine environment, uh, the marine realm. So this was um, a trip that we took to Belize and working with the Belizean Fisheries Department to see how we might be able, or they might be able to use drones uh, to complement their uh, boat patrols around their marine parks. Um, because as you know, it can quickly get expensive uh, you know, sending uh, ranges out on, on those boats to patrol the marine uh, uh, reserves and drones became or you know, could be a useful uh, way to patrol at least part of the, the, the marine parks. And we were there just to, to see if uh, the, the drone or this technology could be operational or could, could operate in those kinds of um, you know, high wind conditions and, and very restricted and limited uh, operating space. And it became, um, and it was quite successful. And we went back a couple more times, and they, I think, they now have a few uh, uh, drones. The next type of application uh, is to do with mapping, and this is probably, uh, I would say, the most promising application, and also the most common one uh, that people use uh, drones for. This is a another trip that we took to New Caledonia. Uh, working with uh, Conservation International uh, a country program on the island. Um, they were interested in using the technology to help to monitor their reforestation efforts. So on the right-hand right -hand side on this picture, you see uh, the drones being flown with a, just a typical uh, RGB sensor, and it was, uh, they were very easily able to create a, an ortho mosaic or map of the forest. But we also flew the drone with other kinds of sensors. In this case, it's a near-infrared uh, camera. Um, and whatever sensors you use, it, it's quite easy to create both two-dimensional maps and also mosaics, as well as uh, point clouds, which can be further processed to give you more information. And this is uh, not just another example of uh, using drones for mapping. And this was in South Australia. Um, here we were working with the Department of Environment who were wanting to see if drones could be used to, uh, as, as a quick and easy way to estimate biomass uh, of the forests. Uh, so in, in that part of, of Australia, um, they have um, a, a problem with fires every summer. And so just before the fire season, they, they conduct uh, prescribed burns or controlled burns of the forests. Uh, and you know, the traditional way of, of estimating uh, or knowing whether their burns are successful or not uh, is to send people out uh, through the forest to look at uh, what, what had been uh, removed uh, with the prescribed burns. But now with drones, uh, they can quite easily uh, fly over the, the, the forest, the, the burnt patch, and also before and after the fires uh, to estimate uh, the, how effective the prescribed burns are in removing the fuel load. Uh, at the habitat scale, uh, drones are also uh, very useful for mapping um, um, the habitats of, of wildlife. Uh, here, this is one of my students' uh, projects in Australia. Uh, he was interested to uh, understand the interaction between uh, this uh, endangered uh, 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 small mammal and the vegetation, the, the native vegetation around the, the warrens or the, 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 yeah, the, the burrows of, of this animal. Um, and it can now be easily done just by flying the drones and, and, and mapping them uh, and looking and, and going back to the lab and studying where the, uh, where the burrows are in relation to the native vegetation. And you can even quite easily see uh, where the entrances to the barrows are and also detect, uh, get some indication of, of which barrows are still active or not. And the third kind of uh, promising application is to do with wildlife surveys. And when Serge and I started uh, using drones, uh, our main motivation was to use them to spot and count orangutan nests in, in Indonesia. And we're still uh, uh, developing the method. 
Um, and the mo at, at the moment, the way we are doing it is to fly transects uh, over the forest, uh, you know, the stitch, the, stitch the images together, and manually look for, for nests uh, in, in those auto mosaics. And, and then try to quantify the number of nests and estimate the population density of orangutans in that area. Um, we also tried uh, using other kinds of sensors, in this case thermal sensors for spotting other kinds of wildlife. Uh, this is again back in South Australia. Uh, this is the yellow-footed rock wallaby, which is an endangered species. And usually they are found in, uh, in cliffs, uh, very hard to get to places. And so we were just exploring ways of using thermal sensors to, uh, to try to detect them uh, in the wild. And as you can see, it's quite uh, easy to, to spot them. This is another animal in, uh, in South Australia that, that we have been using drones for. Can anyone guess what this is? Yeah, yeah correct. So these are koalas. Uh, this, this was another project uh, on Kangaroo Island, which is a small island in South Australia. Uh, we were working with uh, a few plantation companies there uh, because on that island, they are there are too many koalas, and the koalas are chewing up their blue gum plantations. And so they are trying to find a, a cost-effective way of, of estimating uh, basically the scale of their problem, how many koalas are there, and how they have been growing over time. So again, just by flying a thermal uh, imager or thermal sensor, uh, you can quite easily see them uh, uh, in, in the trees. And so we were flying them uh, very early in the morning, 3 to 4 a.m., before the sun uh, rises. Can anyone guess what these are? No? So those are um, colonies of royal penguins. So each, each one of those gray blobs you saw in the previous picture, each one of these gray blobs is a massive colony of hundreds of thousands of royal penguins. Actually, we don't know how many. Um, and traditionally, the way of, of estimating their population size is to go on uh, a helicopter or manned aircraft and try to estimate, just you know, ballpark estimate of, of the size with a pair of binoculars. But now with uh, drones, um, and this was a project of another one of my graduate students, uh, he can easily fly, fly, that, fly drones over them, take pictures, and do the counting back in the lab. Um, also, um, he's trying to use um, uh, computer algorithms to, 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 uh, to improve the, uh, the rate at which he can do the counting and uh, getting the data and extracting the data from these images. Now, uh, so those are some of the uh, promising uses of, of drones, and I'll quickly go over uh, some of the, uh, the, the pitfalls and challenges. Um, and you know, during the few years that we have been using drones in our uh, research, I think this, 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 this is, the next few slides are probably um, more important than the previous ones and in terms of the lessons that we've learned. So the first um, uh, challenge or pitfall that we might want to think about is, is something I would call fit for purpose. So nowadays, whenever someone comes to me to uh, ask me about potentially using drones for their application, the f you know, one of the first questions I would ask is uh, what the scale of their problem is. Because drones are fantastic for uh, applications at certain scales, but at other scales, um, it, th there might be other platforms, other types of uh, technologies that, that would be more appropriate. This is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, landscapes that we have mapped with drones. You know, it's about 15,000 hectare landscape of oil palm somewhere in Borneo. Um, and it took us, uh, took the team several weeks uh, to, to be able to, to map this. So I would say that drones are probably not useful at this scale. Um, and they would be uh, useful probably up to at most a few thousand hectares. And beyond that, uh, one might want to consider using manned aircraft or, or, or satellite-based remote sensing. The other uh, consideration for using this technology is to do with the environment. Now, for many of the places, in many of the places that we've worked in, um, we often had to you know, 
travel quite long distances you know, across remote areas to get to uh, where we want to go. So this was in Chitwan uh, National Park in Nepal. We had to go on you know, tiny boats to, to get to the site. And this uh, was in Madagascar. And one of my, another one of my graduate students uh, had to pack her drone in a box, and the box was somewhere in this mess of luggage. The luggages were on this truck that was on this floating platform, and so it took a quick, quite a while for her to get to where she needed to go. And, and even after you've gotten there, there might also be other environmental challenges. In this case, uh, this is a graduate student from UPenn that I helped. Uh, he brought the drone to Greenland and to, to, uh, for his project on the caribou on, uh, in, in Greenland. And so he, the, he was operating in very challenging conditions. And here's Susanna, my graduate student, was uh, flying drones in a very uh, hilly uh, environment and had several crashes. So again, um, lots to think about in terms of, of uh, the environmental uh, conditions when you're using drones. And the third challenge I, I think would be um, what, uh, what I could, would call the, the last mile delivery of the technology. So a lot of the uh, places that we go to, uh, we went there because of uh, invitations from the, the, usually the forestry department to, uh, to help them build capacity in the use of this technology. But often, oftentimes, um, we, we, had, uh, we faced lots of barriers that had nothing to do with the drones themselves. You know, it could be language barriers, it could be the lack of infrastructure and, and other uh, uh, things that, that uh, um, made it very challenging for us to, to build capacity in those countries. So again, those are some of the issues that, um, that are important to consider when we want to help uh, people on the ground uh, make use of this technology and to operationalize them. And the last, uh, well, the second to last uh, sort of uh, issue that, that we should think about uh, has to do with animal welfare and ethics. Now, nowadays, we see lots of uh, you know, nice pictures and, and videos on, on animals that were filmed or taken with a drone, but we actually still know very little about how drones are affecting them, especially when flown in close proximity to these animals. Um, and I think this is an important area of research that, that needs to happen uh, before uh, more people uh, use this technology to study uh, uh, these wildlife species. So this is this is one of the uh, efforts by by my one of my graduate students. And one of these so this is the fairy penguin or the little penguin in South Australia, and you, if you see look at the picture carefully, you can see that this egg is not really an egg. It's got a, a, a radio transmitter hidden in in, a, in in this fake egg. So what my student is trying to do is to use that fake egg uh, as a way to measure the heart rate of the fairy penguin. And then he would be flying drones at different altitudes above the penguin uh, to see how the drones might be affecting, uh, affecting the bird. So it's still an ongoing project. And, but I think we need uh, more of these kinds of studies to, to understand how we are impacting the animals that, that we're trying to conserve. The last issue that we should be thinking about has to do with the data quality. So it's... it's um, now, it's, now, it's, nowadays, it's quite easy to, to collect the data uh, using drones, especially with the improvement in technology. But we, uh, we haven't really done much in terms of our understanding of how useful the data might be. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, again, Jared, one, uh, my graduate student, decided to, uh, to conduct an experiment, basically trying to, uh, to pit drones against uh, uh, humans uh, in terms of uh, counting uh, colonies of birds. And because we needed to know the true number of birds as a baseline, as a benchmark uh, for this uh, to be a fair competition, you know, he had to uh, basically uh, uh, establish uh, colonies of, of plastic birds or ducks on a beach in South Australia. So we know the true numbers of those colonies. And then we invited very experienced birders uh, to count the number of ducks in those colonies. We flew our drones over them. 
and then we try to see uh, which one uh, got the more accurate and precise estimates of those uh, colonies of, of fake ducks or fake birds. Um, and I won't go into the details of this uh, uh, study, but if you're interested, you can uh, look up the, uh, the paper that is or has been published uh, last year. Um, and moving on from that uh, experiment, um, Jared is also then beginning to think about what we might have to do to uh, get uh, the information we need uh, in cases where the animals on the ground are not stationary like plastic ducks. You know, most animals are not plastic ducks. So we need to understand what we have to do if the animals start moving. Would we then be overestimating or underestimating uh, our counts? Um, we thought about different ways of doing this. You know, we even thought about building robotic ducks so we can program them to move at different rates and then fly our drones and then see how the rate of movement might affect our estimates. Uh, but that turned out not to be very feasible. So what we ended up doing is to use a game engine uh, to build a virtual world uh, so that we can code uh, animals or wildlife to be moving around at different rates. Uh, so in this case, this is just for fun. We did this as one of the first prototypes. Uh, we coded, or they coded, uh, zombie bunnies moving around uh, a landscape. And then we, we coded a drone to fly in that virtual landscape like we would in a real world. Now this, is like a, this is a drone mission within that virtual landscape. And you can see the bunnies moving around. <laughs> so the idea is to... Uh, to have different treatments where the bunnies will be moving at different rates, maybe at different, with different kinds of behavior. And then we fly our missions and see, how, see whether there might be a relationship between the rates of movement and the pattern of movement and the error of the counts that we get. And it might very well turn out that we, we would have to adjust the way we fly our drones to be able to get uh, accurate estimates of, of moving animals. So um, this is one of my last few slides, uh, just a quick summary of what I've uh, been talking about. Uh, there are quite a few, uh, three, three main types of applications that I think are most promising right now in terms of drone technology for, for conservation and, and ecological research. But there are a lot more uh, uh, things to think about in terms of the challenges uh, before we uh, you know, start to use them in the field. And if you are interested, uh, you can go uh, uh, look up our uh, book. Uh, Serge and I just published recently, um, and uh, we have a lot of information, a lot more information uh, in that in that book. Um, so, so is drone uh, technology a hype? Um, I think, uh, in in many ways, it has been, um, but perhaps I think a better way of thinking about uh, drone technology or any other kinds of emerging technology is to think about it through the lens of a, uh, a hype cycle. So a hype cycle is just a way of understanding how technology take up or expectations change over time. Um, usually the hype cycle starts with a trigger. You know, maybe somebody went out and did a drone project and it got covered in the, in, in the press or in, in the media and you know, it, it attracts a lot of attention, and it, it attracts a lot of early adopters of the technology. And also it raises expectations, usually um, uh, unrealistically, so a lot of overinflated expectations. It, it might also attract a lot of funding, so people started to get excited, and the funders jump in, and they throw in lots of money, and it reaches a peak. But very soon after that, it usually crashes, uh, as a lot of the expectations uh, are unmet, and people become uh, disappointed, disillusioned, um, and people started to pull out. You know, the funders pull out. Um, some of the uh, early adopters give up. Uh, but usually there will be a few that uh, uh, persist, um, and the, 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 then we move to a phase of uh, what people call the slope of, of an enlightenment. And in this phase... Um, Expectations are adjusted. You know, people begin to understand what this technology can and cannot do, um, and it slowly uh, begins to yield some results. Uh, some of the funders will come back and support the technology, 
and eventually it might lead to a plateau of, uh, of productivity and the technology becomes mainstream. Usually the, uh, the expectations are, are much lower than, than what uh, was hyped about in the beginning. So I would say drone technology is probably just you know, crawling out of the trough of disillusionment uh, around this time uh, as we are starting to understand what it can, can be uh, most useful for. And hopefully in the next couple of years, it will slowly become a, a more of a mainstream technology. Um, but also I think um, uh, it's important to think about what some of the other much hyped about emerging technologies and techniques that we, we hear in the media these days, uh, where they might be falling on this uh, hype cycle. And I will leave you uh, uh, there and uh, maybe continue uh, in our discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, now we have a few moments for questions. Yep. Uh, okay, great. There's a microphone coming to you. Thank you for the great uh, visuals as well uh, as the information. I was curious about the monitoring of the animals. Mm -hmm. the, those tigers looked like they were curious and maybe getting closer to the sensor, but I could imagine a situation where the, the animals might run away, mm -hmm. uh, in which case you would get into this issue of, of a moving target. Can you tell us a bit more about whether that happened with the penguins or with any other species that you looked at? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so the, the tiger video is not ours, it's just pulled off the internet. Uh, we have most experience working with birds, with especially colony nesting birds, and we found that um, in, in nesting colonies during the breeding season, um, they're actually quite uh, okay with drones flying overhead which is understandable as well because they are protective of, of their nests. Um, but in most other cases, you know, when there's a big flock of birds feeding uh, near a water body, for example, uh, they are very sensitive to drones and, and we would, wouldn't be able to get anywhere near them. And so we would have to fly quite high and, and that affects the quality of the, the data that we collect and so on. Um, yeah, but, but again, that's also another um, area of research that, that, that needs to be looked into. You know, how, how we should be flying drones, both to get to the quality of data we need and also to minimize the impact on, on those animals. Thanks a lot. Uh, you raised the issue of ethics, and uh, you talked about the heartbeat of the penguin. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything about people uh, that or concerns or experiences that you have? Yeah, so um, privacy is, is a big issue. Um, I mean, with regard to conservation also. Oh. Um, have, have drones accelerated perhaps the conflict between people and conservation right. when it comes to um, enforcement and... So we, we, we anticipate that will happen uh, sooner or later, but we haven't really encountered any of those uh, problems yet. So I think what you're saying is uh, the, the poachers, for example, and the, the loggers, illegal loggers, might also be using this technology for, for, their, for their nefarious purposes. Um, I think there might be uh, a situation in the near future where there could be some kind of arms race where... Um, both sites might be using the technology and there could be a need for uh, anti-drone technology as well in, in some of those national parks to, uh, to stop the uh, poachers from using drones, for example. Yeah, so I, I'll use my moderator status to ask a question, which is so because Pete's leads into this very well, which is, so this charge for um, the theme three of the conference is about uh, what studying and governing land systems to transform them towards sustainability. So kind of what, how do you see your work on drones fitting or aligning to that theme? Yeah, I, I think drones is just, uh, just another tool, I guess. Um, it, in some cases, as, as you have heard in my talk, it could be very helpful to uh, reduce the cost of, of collecting the data we need. Um, 
in other cases, um, it might not be useful at all, and in some other cases, it might actually cause additional problems in terms of um, poachers or loggers using the technology. Um, I, th I think we are probably still at a stage now where we are figuring out um, how best to use this technology, and um, it might take a few years for us to, to understand uh, what we need to, what kinds of safeguards we need to put, put in to, uh, to ensure that um, it's, it's actually helping our cause in terms of transforming the, the transformation to, uh, to sustainability. Okay. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay, in the back. Time for a couple more. Thank you very much. I, I would like to, to explore uh, an idea I had. And you're flying drones over, for example, penguins. Have you ever tried to link your data to high resolution satellite images? And what's the potential of using drone data to train satellite images? Yeah, we have done exactly that, actually, to use uh, drone-derived data as kind of a ground-truthing data. Um, rather than you know, the traditional kind of ground truthing where you need people walking in, in the forest. So we've done that, we've published a paper on that, and, and it's, 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 it's a lot more uh, cost effective than the more traditional way of doing ground truthing. Uh, but again, it's, it's just another tool, it's just another way of collecting data. You still need to know how to use the data for what you want to do with, with the satellite-based remote uh, sensed data. Okay, and maybe our next speaker can get his slides ready for this last question. No, la one more question. Oh. Yeah. There Thank you. It's funny enough, it's almost exactly the same question. Slightly <laughs> okay. different. Um, I was curious to know uh, how well you've integrated um, drone information with other data sources, um, and or do you just have them? I mean, it's sort of as discrete projects. But. Okay. Um, yeah. So at, at the moment, we are still just using mainly just using drones uh, for specific data collection purposes. Uh, but it's not all just images as well. So we've also used them to, uh, to, uh, to survey for, for bats, for example, using, uh, just using drones to carry um, the, the bat detectors. And they've proven to be quite, quite useful because um, the noise from the drone is at a much lower frequency than, than the, the bats, the calls, the, bats uh, the calls from the bats. Um, but we haven't, uh, use drone derived data with other sorts of data apart from the ground truthing example that I uh, just mentioned. 